in her husband's cottage. The Holy Mother stayed at Balaram Babu's house for about a week and then went to Kamrapukur. Before starting for the place, she visited Dakshineswar to bow down before all the deities and have another look at everything associated with the Master. Swami Yogananda, Golapma and some others accompanied her up to Kamrapukur. They went to Burdwan by train, from where they walked the rest of the way for lack of money. The first phase of their journey from Budvan to Uchlan, a distance of about 16 miles, tired out the mother very much and she felt hungry. At Uchlan, Golapma managed to cook a little khichudi on tasting which the mother said, O oh Golap, what a delicacy you have prepared. Swami Yogananda and others left for their places after staying at Kamrapukur for a few days. Then began the mother's sorrowful life at that village, during which time she was practically alone, as she had none to sympathize with her or even to talk to her, bearing some two or three old acquaintances. When during the master's illness at Kosipore, his nephew Ramlal came to see him one day, the master told him, You will serve Bhavtarini, Kali at Dakshineswar, and so you will not lack anything. He then turned to the mother and said, You will live at Kamrapukur and look after Lakshmi one a little. You will not have to provide for her food, but see that she does not leave home to go elsewhere. The devotees will have as much veneration for you as they have for me. To Ramlal again, he said, See that your aunt stays at Kamrapukur. Ramlal replied, She will stay wherever she wills. The master easily saw through the meaning of that statement and he reproved him saying, How is that, my boy? Why have you been born a man? Lakshmi Devi had been to Vrindavan with the mother, but she did not go to Kamrapukur, preferring to live with her brothers at Dakshineswar. As for Ramlal, he not only refused to shoulder any responsibility for the mother, but also created a tremendous difficulty for her. Kralukyanath Vishwas, son of Mathuranath and grandson of Rani Rasmani, granted a small allowance of seven rupees for the mother. But during her stay at Vrindavan, Ramlal dinned it into the ears of the cashier of the temple that the devotees of the master were looking after her, and that there was, therefore, no need for an allowance from the temple. So that contribution was stopped. One Swami Vivekananda, and others argued against such a step, but to no effect. When the mother heard of it, she said with extreme indifference, If they have stopped it, let them have their way. When even the master is gone, what shall I do with money? The devotees of the master had decided that they would contribute 10 rupees a month for the maintenance of the wife of their guru. But that pious wish did not materialize. Hence the life of the mother at Kamrapukur was not only solitary, but also one of privation. Sri Ramakrishna once said to her, You will stay at Kamrapukur, you will grow potherbs, eat your rice with greens and call on Hari. This was not an order, but it was a wish of the master, a hint of a means of her livelihood. As though to fulfill those words, the mother had to follow that very pattern of life in those days. There were times when she boiled some rice, but had no salt to savour it with. When after some days the state of affairs at Kamrapukur became known in Calcutta, the devotees took her there. But that was long after. In the meantime the mother continued to suffer, without even informing anybody, in the very mud hut which the master had bequeathed to her, for even then was ringing in her ears that counsel of the master, mind you, don't put forth your hand to anybody even for a dime. You will have no lack of coarse food and cloth. Once you put forth your hand for a dime from anyone, you sell your head to him. Not even living on charity is preferable to living in other people's houses. Even if any one of the devotees should offer to keep you in his house with love and respect, 
you should not give up your own home at Kamarapukur. Let us for a moment stop here to look around the Kamarapukur of those days. The Kamarapukur of the Bahud days of the Master must have changed a good deal with the change of time, as is quite natural, still the village did not, in all probability, appear new to the mother's eyes, though there is a world of difference between the Kamarapukur of the later part of 1887 and the Kamarapukur of today, 1954. To the south of the master's house at that time, and contiguous to it, was the house of Shuklal Goswami, known popularly as the Gosai Mihal, which looked something like a landholder's office establishment with high brick walls around and a brick house in the middle. Near the present well south of the master's temple was the entrance of the Gosai Mihal which opened to the road on the west. South of the Mihal was a small pond on whose bank was the memorial of a sati of the Pine family. Further south was the guest house of the Lehes. East of the dwelling house of the Lehes, in the centre of the village, is a big pond called the Kamrapukur, tank of the Kamars, on the southwest corner of which the Kamars, lit blacksmiths, still live. Ghani Kamarni, who acted as the midwife at the birth of the master, was born among these people. North of the master's house is the big pond called the Haldarpukur or the tank of the Haldars, who no longer live in the village, but have shifted to other places. In the mother's time the two-storied brick house of the Lehes was still habitable and the family was well off. Near the master's house there were many sweetmeat sellers and starting from the northeastern corner of the house up to the marketplace there were rows of shops on either side of the main village road. The dome sweeper quarters along the road to the northwest of the master's house had not been vacated then. And the yugis, weavers, still had their homesteads between the master's house and the Haldarpukur, and they still conducted worship at their Siva temple. The mango grove of Manik Raja had not been denuded, and the tall palm trees still reflected themselves on the calm and transparent waters of the tanks and ponds scattered everywhere. The master's homestead then consisted of three mud houses for dwelling purposes, with thatched roofs standing in a line on the southern side of the village road running from east to west. The house on the east, outside the courtyard, served as a parlour. The house in the middle, which was the largest and over which another story was raised later, was used by Rameshwar, the elder brother of the master. The westernmost house was used by the master, and in this was spent the Kamrapukur phase of the life of the mother. Between these two dwelling houses was a small door leading to the northern road. At right angels to the master's bedroom was the shrine of Raghuvira built of mud and straw. The kitchen house along the southern boundary wall had three rooms, one of which was used by the mother. In the middle of the eastern wall was the entrance to the courtyard. Along this wall, between the entrance and the kitchen was the husking shed where the master was born. The altar of Raghuvira and other deities that existed in those days was built by the master's father Kshudiram Chattopadhyaya with earth carried by himself on his head. At present there are four deities, the image of Gopala installed by Lakshmi Devi, the white stone emblem of Rameshwara Siva brought by Kshudiram from Rameshwar, the Raghuvira stone which he got in a dream and a pitcher filled with water, painted with vermilion and holding mango leaves on its top, which represents the goddess Sitla. About Sitla the mother said, She, indeed, is our family deity. I heard it related how my father-in-law saw in a dream that the great mother, in her form of Sitla, a little girl with a robe red as vermilion, was sweeping away all calamities, all the refuse, with grooms in her hand, and holding a pitcher at her waist, sprinkling ambrosial water with the mango leaves, thereby bringing peace to all beings by removing all cares. One Sitla is only one of the aspects of the Great Mother. That's why there is that pitcher painted with vermilion and containing water. 
for bringing about peace. The water is changed on special days. The mother also stated that Raghuvira was the same as Ramchandra whose birthplace was in the northwest and so the master's father offered him khichudi to suit his northwestern taste. Kamarpukur was then a flourishing, populous and busy village and because it was so, it frightened the mother, full of modesty as she was. Moreover, these people without culture, without liberal ideas and sympathy, remained unmoved at the helpless condition of this widow, and at the same time they lacked any curiosity for imbibing higher ideas from her. It was natural, therefore, for her to be faced with many problems. She continued to wear her bracelets, in obedience to the bidding of the master. But the rural critics, unmindful of such a vision, became increasingly vociferous, and she took these away from her hands. Her second problem was, how to live so far away from the Ganges, a love for whose holy waters was ingrained in her. We saw her going on sacred occasion with village women to the Ganges for a dip, not to speak of her stay on its bank at Dakshineswar for a long thirteen years. Such maladjustments made her a little nervous, and she thought she would one day go for a bath in that river again. Just then she saw the master approaching along the road in front, followed by Narendra, Baburam, Rakhal and other devotees. From his blessed feet gushed forth a stream of water which moved before him in waves, and so she thought, I see that he himself is everything, from his blessed feet springs the Ganges. Hence she plucked handfuls of red china roses from near Raghuvira's shrine and laid them as an offering on the waters of this Ganges. Then the master told her, Don't remove the bracelets from your hands. Don't you know the Vaishnav Tantra? The mother replied, What is Vaishnav Tantra? I know nothing of it. Gordasi will come this afternoon, said the master, you will hear from her. That very afternoon came Gorima, who explained to the mother with the help of the Vaishnav scriptures how there can be no such thing as widowhood for her, since her husband's body was not material but spiritual. Furthermore, she was none other than Lakshmi herself, the goddess of fortune and the consort of Vishnu. For her to be without ornaments would mean the deprivation of the whole world of its good things. One later on, when Yoginma went to Kamrapukur, the mother while describing that incident to her added, The master then stood at the foot of yonder peepul tree. I saw at last the master disappearing in the body of Naran eat the dust of the place, bow down. When this news travelled from mouth to mouth and reached Swami Vivekananda, he said that it would have been better for him not to have heard of the entry of the master into his body. However that might have been, one cannot but note that the incident made a tremendous impression on the mother's mind about the mission of the master and the sanctity of Kamrapukur. She got over the fear of idle gossip and put on the bracelets again and her cloth also continued to have a thin red border instead of being wholly white. These she never discarded till the end. The rural critics too became silent. Such problems like these agitate most the women folk, and the solutions also emerge from them. When hostile gossip about the mother reached the ears of Prasannami, daughter of the village landlord, Dharmadas Laha, who had been a widow from early life and was respected by all around for her virtue and wisdom, she folded her hands respectfully and touching her forehead with them in token of salutation, said, Gadai, Ramakrishna, and Gadai's wife, they are divine. The scurrilous women of the village never afterwards opened their mouths. Although the two problems of the mother, with wearing of ornaments and living near the Ganges, were thus solved, the other complicated ones defeat solution for some time. Soon after she came to the village, she sought the help of Prasanami and Dhani Kamarni for securing a companion to be by her side. Prasanami gave her the assurance, as to that, my dear, 
you need have no anxiety, my maid servant will sleep with you at night. If the maid servant failed to turn up, Dhani's sister Shankari slept in her house at night and one of their brothers helped her at odd jobs. Prasanami always looked after her needs and the mother too relied on her for advice. Prasanami then lived in the Gosai Mehul. She was very devotional in temperament and liked to look after the comforts of guests and Brahmans. So she and the Holy Mother spent long hours in talking over religious matters. In spite of this casual help and oral sympathy, the mother still felt very lonely and unsafe. She was well prepared to spend her days by tying her worn-out cloth in a hundred knots, digging the earth with a spade and growing pot herbs for her food, but over the uncertainty of the future, family differences and social indifference and oppression, she had no control whatsoever. True, it was that from the psychological point of view she was quite free from such fears after the Master's vision, as she herself said, then, as I began to have visions of the Master, that fear gradually subsided. These visions again were intimate. One day the Master appeared and said, Feed me with Khichudi. The mother thought that as Raghuvira was identical with Ramakrishna, though they differed in form, it would be enough to offer the khichudi to the former. She did so, thinking all the while in a spiritual mood that the master himself was having his meal. But despite this spiritual sublimity, the environmental antagonism continued just as before and caused not a little anxiety. The question crops up here, when the mother was in these circumstances, what were her people at Jairambati doing? We know that they were not particularly well off. Her mother, Shamsundari Devi, was having a very hard time. Still, when she heard of her daughter's distress, she sent her son, Kalikumar, to Kamrapukur to bring her to Jairambati. But the mother refused to go just then. When she did go after some time, Shamsundari could not check her tears at the sight of her extreme poverty. We like to fancy that this visit was during the annual Jagadhatri worship, for which the mother had an innate attraction and as such, would not have liked to miss the occasion. Shamsundari Devi took this occasion to hold her back, but the daughter replied, Now, I am going to Kamrapukur, mother. Afterwards, it'll be as he ordains. In the course of a short time, a great change came over the Kamrapukur family. The mother's nephews, Ramlal and Shivran, and her niece, Lakshmi Devi, then lived generally at Dakshineswar, though they very often came to their village home to stay there for short periods. We have noted that Ramlal, or Ramlal Dada, was somewhat indifferent towards the mother. But this cannot be said about Shivram or Shibudada, as he was generally called. Shibudada received from the mother his first arms after his investiture with the sacred thread, and so he regarded her more as his godmother than as an aunt and the mother to treated him as a son. Long after, when the mother was permanently residing at Jairambati, Shibuddha sat for his lunch at Kamrapukur one day. But when he had half finished, the desire grew in him to eat something from his godmother's hand, and so he walked to Jairambati and after having been fed by Holy Mother returned to Kamrapukur with a bitel in his mouth given by her. We have many such instances of the mother's affection for all of them. Once during this period, Lakshmi Devi and many others were present at Kamrapukur. Till then the family was a joint one. But as misfortune would have it, the family was broken up by partition. Lakshmi Devi was a Vaishnav by temperament. Sometimes she sang Vaishnav songs inside the house with a sweet voice, which attracted people of a similar faith. The mother could not be quite easy about this. She remembered that when Lakshmi Devi sang in this way before the master, Imitating fully the gestures and postures of professional singers, the master, while enjoying it, was amused, 
but he warned the mother, that's Lakshmi's temperament, don't you tread on her footsteps and throw your modesty to the winds. Besides this difference, the divergence of outlook in daily talks and actions between the Holy Mother and the rest of the family became more pronounced as days rolled on. The mother preferred to spend the rest of her days peacefully in the thought of the master, while around her others swirled the currents and cross-currents of the world into whose vortex they wanted to draw the mother as well. The mother remained unperturbed and unruffled, never uttering a word of protest. But the Chatterjee family did nothing to avert the split that is usual under such circumstances. Thus, despite the passivity on the one side, the aggressiveness on the other through the mother out of the main body. One day, on her return from Jarambati, the mother found that Ramlal Dada had left for the Kshineswar with the others after making some arrangement for the daily worship of Raghuvira. To her share had fallen the little cottage of the master, she entered therein determined to keep up its sanctity. On a study of the mother's life we come to learn that commencing from her arrival at Kamrapukur in September 1887, she lived there for about nine months, up to April 1888, after which the devotees brought her to Calcutta. From Calcutta she again went to Kamrapukur in February next and lived there almost for a similar period. Most probably, the subsequent periods of her stay there were never so long, though she came to live there quite a number of times. One, it is not possible to determine definitely the time of various incidents that took place during those periods of stay. In the account so far presented, we have made no attempt to date the incidents exactly and in what follows, too, we shall not try to do more than indicate the dates in a general way. During the mother's stay at Kamrapukur, the visits from the devotees were few and far between. Of course, most of them were too poor to undertake the pilgrimage, but the few who went there were received heartily by the mother, for the meetings of persons that are akin and familiar were always delightful. Such visits rather relieved the monotony of her otherwise dull village life. But all visits were not welcome, on the contrary, some were a source of trouble. Once at least, the mother had to face such an embarrassing situation. Harish, a devotee of the master, was a constant visitor at the first math of the Ramakrishna order at Barnagore, and this frightened his wife. With a view to counteracting this tendency to renunciation, she surreptitiously applied drugs and charms, which brought about a certain derangement of his mind. While still under the influence of those drugs, Harish visited the mother at Kamrapukur. The mother could at once see through the mind of the man and hence wrote to the math to take him away. Accordingly, Swami's Sardananda and Niranjananda started for Kamrapukur. But before they could reach there, Harish's lunacy grew out of control and the mother had to devise her own remedy for this. We present the incident in her own words. At this time Harish came and stayed at Kamrapukur. One day, I was returning from a neighboring house. As I stepped into the courtyard, Harish began chasing me. Harish was not in his senses then. His wife had drugged him and madness had followed upon it. There was nobody else in the house, so where could I escape? In a hurry, I began circling round the barn of Paddy, near the master's birthplace. But he would not give up the chase. After going round for seven times, I could run no longer. Then I stood firm working myself up to my full stature, lit assuming my own form. And then, placing my knee on his chest, and taking hold of his tongue, I slapped him on his cheeks so hard that he began to gasp for breath. My fingers became red. It is difficult now to ascertain in what sense the mother used the words my full stature. Many believe that, since the mother was an incarnation of the mother of the universe, 
it was possible for her to assume all kinds of divine forms and attitudes, and in the present context, she became Bagla to punish with heroic hands the demon in. The person of Harish.1 There is no reason why a devotee should not believe this, but even a matter-of-fact man will be surprised to see how the mother, who was noted all along for her modesty, meekness and mercy, could at a critical moment be on her mettle. When we look more closely into such incidents of her life, it strikes us that the poet who penned the line in the Chandi, of all beings in the three worlds, heaven, earth and hell, in you alone, O Goddess, is seen a kindness of heart combined with heroism in fight, was truly a seer. That punishment cured Harish not only for the time being. Later he fled to Vrindavan on the arrival of Swami Niranjananda, and there became fully normal after some time. One winter morning, in the beginning of 1888, Krishnabhvini Devi, wife of the great devotee Balaram Babu, and her mother Matangini Devi, came to the master's birthplace from Antpur with a Brahman girl and a faithful man as escort. As devout Hindus they knew that their guru's household, and that of a Brahman too, should not be burdened on any account, and hence they placed sufficient money in the mother's hands for making a suitable offering to Raghuvira, whose prasada only they would eat. The mother made suitable arrangements for their comfort, and on the fourth day she took them to Jairambati, where, too, they spent three nights and then left for Calcutta by way of Kamrapukur 1. In the midst of fear and poverty, the Holy Mother kept burning the lamp of her spiritual ministry. It was probably during her second stay at Kamrapukur. There lived a monk from Odisha in a cottage attached to the outer wall of Gosaimi Hill, inside which dwelt Prasannami who looked after the monk's needs. He had incurred the displeasure of some hot-headed and well-connected young men of the locality, so that he was on the point of leaving the village when the mother came to his help. The monk commanded the respect of the common folk and thus with their help she proceeded to build for him a cottage at the southwest corner of Haldarpukur. The rainy season was then imminent and the sky looked threatening. Hence the mother prayed fervently with folded hands, O Lord, kindly forbear, kindly forbear. Let his thatch be completed and then you can pour as much as you like. After the monk had been given a place to lay his head in, the mother used to supply him with his foodstuff, though she had hardly sufficient for herself, and inquired of him every morning and evening, Father Monk, how are you, dear? But the monk did not live there for long, for, as Providence would have it, he expired soon in that cottage. Though the mother was in extremely indigent condition in the beginning, matters improved a little in course of time. The devotees, coming to know of her difficulties, organized what help they could. In addition, her share of the land at Shihar, left as a trust by master in the name of the family deity, and the Lakshmijala land which came down from the master's father, Shudiram, as a heritage, yielded sufficient paddy not only for herself but also for some charity. Towards the end of the period we are discussing now, there was a maidservant named Sagarama, Sagar's mother, who helped the mother in her domestic work. From her it has been gathered that she used to do the shopping for the mother. A portion of whatever the mother cooked at noon, she kept in a pot for Sagarama, and when the woman came, she handed it over to her saying, Put this in your mouth first and drink some water, and after that begin your work. During the three days that the goddess Durga is worshipped annually in Bengal, special worship was done and offerings made to Sitla by the Chatterjees at their Kamrapukur house. Brahmans were fed on this occasion. When the time for the feast came, the mother used to say, Shibu, Shibu Dada, you spread the leaf plates and serve salt and water, while I serve rice on all the leaves for the Brahmans. Sagarama further says, hers was the store of Lakshmi, 
goddess of wealth, as it were, nothing ran short. Whatever surplus there remained, she lovingly gave away to us the next day. Over and above all this, the Holy Mother fed a number of guests. We have noticed the Mother's diligence at Dakshineswar, Shampukur and Kosipore. At Kamrapukur too, the same assiduity was in evidence, rather it increased because of the manifold responsibilities she was burdened with. She got together all that was necessary for cooking food, cooked it and offered it to Raghuvira with all punctiliousness. If Shibudada happened to be at Kamrapukur, he performed the worship, otherwise somebody else did it. Before the daily worship commenced, the mother finished her bath in the Haldarpukur and started cooking on two ovens and this was finished before the sun moved away from the veranda, i.e. before noon, it being unbefitting to offer food to the deities after midday. Of a truth, the mother tried her best to follow the master's wishes she was ready to wear herself out at Kamrapukur through toil, tears, privation and disease. But there is a limit to endurance whether physical or mental. Where the environment is wholly unhelpful or antagonistic, one with a sense of self-respect cannot continue spiritual practices long in a course of strenuous adjustment and compromise. Differences of outlook were there to be sure, in addition, the moral and spiritual atmosphere of the village was unbearable for her. The way in which the influential young men of the village misbehaved towards the monk from Odisha, disregarding the intervention of such a venerable lady as Prasannami, set the mother thinking much about her own future. And on top of all this came the insistent calls from her children in Calcutta, which ultimately proved too strong for her affectionate heart. Ultimately, Kamrapukur ceased to be her main place of residence. This does not, however, mean that she neglected her husband's bequest, it only means that she took up her task in a wider and more effective sense. And though she did not permanently stay at Kamrapukur, she spent money for the proper maintenance of the master's cottage. If any devotee went that way, she reminded him of its sanctity and advised him to spend the night in it so that he might imbibe some of its holiness. She helped her nephew Ramlal with money in putting a new story over their own dwelling house. And she bestowed particular care on the worship of Raghuvira and spent money for the purpose. Her latter-day disciples were curious for details about her leaving Kamrapukur and plied her with various questions. One devotee asked her, Mother, you don't so much as visit the master's house, when you come to the village from Calcutta, you go straight to your father's house. Are you, in this, treading in the footsteps of your predecessors? The mother laughed heartily and replied, Not so, my son. Can I forget the master's house? Shibu is my godson. But the master is now no longer in the physical body, I am pained if I go there. That's why I don't go. The irremediable pangs of separation was there to be sure, but to that were added the external maladjustments owing to the antagonism, negligence and inequities of the people around her of which she seldom spoke as it hurt her to expose others' faults. On rare occasion only she opened out her mind a little. To a boy devotee who attended on her, she said, When after the master's passing away I moved about here and there for some time and then went to live at Kamrapukur, my relatives seemed to be indifferent towards me. And coming to learn of the high-handedness of the villagers, my mother brought me here to Jairambati, she did not allow me to live at Kamrapukur any more. From that time on I have been living with my brothers through stress and strain. And now, again, they complain, she does not look after us. The human mind is strange indeed. 1. She became a widow soon after marriage and stayed in her father's house at Kamrapukur. 1. The Holy Mother said, Kralukya used to give me seven rupees. After the Master's death, 
Dinu, the cashier, and all others conspired to stop that money. My relatives, too, who were there, treated me as an ordinary mortal and joined with them. Udbodhan V L X X V I I P P. Eleven to twelve. See also Shri Shri Lakshmi Mani Devi. One in Bengali she talkarche, making cool or removing the heat. Sitla is feminine of Sital. Sitla is generally the goddess of pox or similar calamities, but the mother here gives the word a higher meaning, equating Sitla with the universal mother. One some Bengali books, for instance. Gorima PP 110 to 12 plays this incident at Vrindavan but the mother recounted it as we have presented it wide shri mer katha part 2 p 148 one from the notes of master mahashe we gather that she lived at kamrapukur during the following periods end of october 1890 february and july to october 1891 July of 1892 January and July of 1893 13 May 1895 November 1895 to January 1896 May and Durga Puja days September to October of 1897 one vagala is one of the 10 mahavidyas forms of the great mother in that form she killed a demon in the very same way as the mother punished harish one The incident had an important bearing on the mother's subsequent life. It can be inferred that though the mother tried her utmost to hide her poverty and helplessness from the devotees, their loving eyes penetrated into the truth, and therefore, after their return to Calcutta, they told the other devotees all these facts. As a result, the mother was soon brought to Calcutta. The other version is that Uncle Prasanna, who then lived in Calcutta, divulged the facts to Ramlal, Golapma, and others, and thus the devotees were stirred to action. In any case, Golapma took a leading part in this matter.